You're watching The Blockchain Interviews, hosted by Dan Weisskopf. Each episode features interviews with leading industry experts so that viewers can have a deeper understanding of today's quickly evolving blockchain marketplace. I'm super excited to have David Goon here from T0 um, to talk to us about the progress he's making on the blockchain that he's building. And uh, David, thanks for very much for, for joining us today. Um, Hey Dan, thanks. Thanks for having me. Maybe there's a handful of people in this world who don't know your background. I'm I'm kidding oh, actually, but <laughs> in all seriousness, though, your background's phenomenal for um, as an experience to build T zero. And I'd love to just spend like three minutes, four minutes to give everybody the background because some people may not know um, your background. I was uh, a little over about 25 years ago, I was one of the executives at a place called the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, and when I was there, I was in charge of basically what I'll call the product. So a lot of product development and bringing products to market. So um, I came up with a bunch of products, worked with uh, the research department, but came up with some innovative products there. Um, and it was a great and interesting experience. Uh, around uh, late 2000, I got approached by a couple investment banks, uh, some of the biggest name ones, saying some people at, uh, at some of the biggest investment banks saying, hey, there's a guy we're backing who's doing a startup in the energy space to compete with Enron Online. It's a company called Intercontinental Exchange. Um, and uh, he's a really sharp, a dynamic guy, but needed somebody with some markets background. So uh, I joined ICE very early in 2001. It was just a startup. Um, and uh, basically, uh, we were a very small company. And over the course of 20 years or so, um, we built it up to, I think when I left, a little over a $70 billion public company. We bought, I think while I was there, about 46 acquisitions. Um, the one most people know is the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, but along the ways, I, I, you know, developed product, especially early on, developed products for clearing, competed against uh, existing giants in the industry from, you know, New York Mercantile Exchange to uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange to... Uh, you know, basically, you know, the Deutsche Börse, all the large exchanges, and we came out with product in an innovative way. And at that time, what we really did was pretty, uh, I wouldn't say it was simple, it's complicated. We did two things. We were competing against over-the-counter markets, and we were competing uh, against the um, existing exchange uh, listed markets. Uh, we were using a technology, a lot of them were open outcry, screaming and yelling. Uh, we were doing everything on the internet with an internet-based trading platform. And we were making it a lot easier and more transparent to a great number of people to trade the products. Our belief was if you put it in more people's hands, more people would trade it. And that's exactly what happened. And we grew the business. We also did several other things while we were there is um, we started a data business, which at first it was, you know, the proverbial give away the uh, razors and then sell the blades. We gave away the data and then started charging for it, which is a multi-billion dollar business now. And uh, we also started clearing our own products, not outsourcing the clearing of our products. Um, so those were kind of the kind of three pillars at that time. And as, as time evolved, the company grew very big. I think there was probably a few dozen people when I was there. And when I left, I think we had close to 15,000. I mean, the company grew quite a bit. And uh, we just kept trying to operate it like a startup company. And I think that culture was really, uh, really important to the growth of ICE, being able to make quick decisions um, and it was a, uh, and make um, you know, work with smart people and, and take some risks. 
um, but but calculated risks. And it was a global company. Um, we were operating in I still is operating all over the globe. So as I was uh, looking to retire from ICE, I was approached uh, by Talion and T0 about um, becoming their CEO at the time. Uh, there were some interesting ideas because I'm, uh, I'd like to think I'm a creative guy in this space uh, that I thought I could use the infrastructure of T0 for to uh, do some some interesting things, and uh, I decided, you know, why not try something uh, new? Because I do love solving problems. So that's kind of my background in a relatively. I think I did in about five minutes. So, but you were a little bit modest. So you were chief, the chief strategy officer. So yeah, I was one of the guys who was part of the you know I was the poor management team. Um, and uh, I was there from pretty much the beginning till um, I left. In fact, the only most of the people who worked for me retired, which tells you one thing. And then uh, me and Jeff Spreck were the last two kind of original people there. He's still the CEO uh, of the company. But look, it was it was a great team. I was able to do you know uh, Jeff was a great and that he gave me a lot of rope to do. Uh, a lot of things um and you know we had a very um good culture i mean we we'd all argue about issues and debate them hot hot you know hotly but which jeff encouraged um and i think uh, uh you came out with some good decisions and then when you make a decision you went with it so yeah it went it was a uh, it was it was great it was a lot of fun um and it was great to see a company go from, you know, 30 people to to 15,000 and, and become, you know, global. And So were you coming up with the ideas and bring them to Jeff and then you oh. debate or, or with the team and then you'd also be responsible for the execution of the idea? Okay, but sometimes that was the case. Um, I would say, you know, the way... The, you know, the way we in, encourage the culture, the ideas can come from anybody. Then you have to kind of figure out, is it a good idea or a bad idea? So sometimes I'd come up with the ideas, but you know, let me take a let me take a step back. And I came up with a lot of product at the CME too. Um, you know, we're just a conduit to what's going on in the marketplace. So, you know, we would go talk to, you know, whether it be in, when I was at the CME interest rate swap dealers, come up with ways to trade. Uh, I came up with mid-curve options or or packs and bundles when I was at the CME, uh, which is how everyone trades now, interest rate products. You started talking to the customers, asking them how they do their business. What's the you know impediments to them doing more business? What are their problems they see? Um, and then you just start getting ideas or they'll have ideas a lot of times, and then you have to maybe alter them, change them, fit them to your model. Uh, and, and and that's how we did it at ICE. So I learned the energy markets, uh, but you talk to the customer base, you see what they're trying to accomplish, and then you add to it. I mean, at ICE, clearing was a big issue because there was a lot of counterparty risks, especially post Enron. Um, you know, Enron, for those who uh, are too young to remember, was a really uh, interesting model. They everyone used to call everyone on with visa vis brokers um, to trade a lot of things in, let's say, the energy space, in particular gas and power, which Enron and Enron decided, why don't we just put it all out on the internet, and we'll have our traders make the other side of of the market. Well, it became very successful. The problem is, you know, it's it's like Las Vegas. Las Vegas works great because the house sets the odds. The casino gets to set the odds. The problem with Enron was they couldn't control the odds, right? They're, they're making, they're the other side of every trade, but they can't control what happens in the world's, you know, gas markets, geopolitical issues and in, in power and things like that. And eventually that caught up with them. I mean, there was a lot of other issues they had, like the traders able to mark their set their own marks every day, which leads to 
potential abuse and did in certain cases. But um, in general, um, counterparty risk became a big issue. So we had to solve a way to take the over-the-counter markets, which took a little thinking how to take an existing over-the-counter market and clear it. So we spent you know, some time early doing that. And once after Enron went, we got all these people to start clearing um, these markets and teaching them how to do it and explaining them the differences. And I won't get into it. There's a lot of there was a lot to do there. Um, all of a sudden, while being a little bit of a slow start, it was a snowball rolling down the hill. Once we got it going, it just kept going and going. So back to your question on how ideas came in, um, you know, it almost didn't matter. You know, a lot of times we would say, we say Noah 10 times to every idea you take. It's like a, a a gem. You look at it has tons of facets and you try and find the flaws. And sometimes there's fatal flaws and the product doesn't go through. Um, and sometimes you have to refine it and then it brought, we bring it to market. So that's, that's a lot of what we did. And then getting people I knew from my Chicago Mercantile Exchange days as the markets went a lot electronic, a lot of those people became some of the larger liquidity providers in other markets. And they were looking for other markets where they had opportunities. And I was able to uh, convince them that there was a lot of opportunity in the markets we were trading. And then I had to adapt our technology, explain the requirements that were needed for our technology people to adapt our systems that would make it easy for um, those participants to start trading our markets. And a lot of them did, and a lot of them made a lot of money um, and really uh, started trading them. So I was also involved in all the access to our markets vis-a-vis -vis APIs and how to get you know all our market making programs I was originally designing and getting people to start new markets, which is a little a lot of art and science and relationships. Um, so I was involved heavily in that uh, through my entire time at ICE, because it's one thing to have a good product, it's another thing to get people to trade it. I mean, probably the getting people to trade it's probably harder than coming up with a good product in, in, in many, many cases, unfortunately, you know, um, so. And, and two questions along those lines, and we'll move on. Um, and, and they still remain active. Um, it wasn't, I mean, it's a passive investment in T0 by ICE, but, hmm. but did you bring some people from ICE over and, you know, is there a constant dialogue? Um, so we have, one, you know, we've always had a person from ICE on the board, um, which is great. And I've asked that it be someone more from the New York Stock Exchange, which is probably a little more closer aligned to what we're doing. Because as you know, at T0, what we do is uh, primarily almost exclusively securities, um, almost exclusively. And then um, I brought in uh, uh, Sophia Corona, who's our CFO, who was the um, CFO at a company we bought called CreditX and then became its COO and then did business development work with me um, at ICE. And then RJ Cummings, who was a uh, product development person at ICE, started around the same time I did. Um, he came over as well, and he's doing the same thing here, which is, um, you know, back when we were a startup, really getting into the nitty gritty of, of the detail of uh, what we have to do. And, and there's just a lot of detail to do things right. So those are some of the people. Um, and Edwin Marcial uh, uh, was our original chief technology officer. He came on our board now. He's actually stepped off the board, but is still providing us uh, technical uh, assistance. So, to some degree, um, T zero is basically an exchange, right? Well, we're an ATS, uh, you know, and a broker dealer. So, you know, our uh, chief legal counsel and our EVP Alan will say, "No, we're not an exchange." Um, when you look at our platform or any ATS, it you know looks like the way you think of an exchange. There's bids and offer. It's a bid and offer and stuff, but it's not a 
full-fledged uh, securities exchange. That's a kind of legal different, uh, not only in the SEC's eyes, but it's it, it's it's a level up in terms of um, requirements and, and regulation. But but you still have some of the same requirements, right? FINRA, SEC. Yeah, we're we're governed by you know SEC and FINRA. We trade securities. We meet all our regulatory requirements, um, obviously. But we're not, you know, uh, we're you know you don't do a public offering. You know, we're not doing IPOs. We don't have, you know, a fully regulated uh, exchange like let's say the New York Stock Exchange or the Nasdaq. We're not not that, but we do have. You know, we meet the requirements for an ATS and a broker dealer, which are are, are different requirements. And, and to uh, let's let's also cover why it's important that you're involved with a blockchain. I think a lot of people think about it in different ways. Let let's. I think at the heart of what it is, it's an immutable record of ownership. That's really what it is. Sure. It's a way of recording ownership that's not challengeable it's immutable um and in the right circumstances and i think we're really just at the first inning of this ball game right uh you'll start seeing a lot of real world assets i think you know 20 years from now 30 you could pick whenever and i can talk about uh we can talk about how fast things happen but um and things are moving more logarithmically right but uh it's a way to report ownership in an immutable way. And there's so many ways you can do it. I mean, think about your own home ownership. You know, think of, you know, you have to get, you know, mortgage insurance and all that, title, or rather title insurance, all these things. Sure. All these things are because, you know, pieces of paper get lost and people lose things and all these things. Blockchain, you know, theoretically can solve a lot of ownership issues and there are a lot of them in the world and what happens when you have that i think is there's you know there's it's a it's disruptive because it eliminates some people in a food chain that make money along the way helping things get recorded and 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 you know and, and paid for it so uh you know insurance title insurance, things like that, all you could theoretically see may not have a place if there's an immutable record. So that's one aspect is just proof of ownership. And that applies everything from equities, you know, ultimately, which was, I think, the original design, you know, to things like real estate and hard assets that people, you know, uh, own. The other interesting thing about uh, blockchain is um, if in certain cases, if it's used properly, the people who uh, own, let's say, the asset or the owner of the total group of assets. So let's take a, a situation of securities. So in securities, um, if you buy a share of Apple stock, Right, you probably go through your broker, XYZ broker, you know, maybe it's E-Trade or Charles Schwab or who knows, right? Apple doesn't know you, they know the brokerage account, right? They don't know the beneficial owner, which is you. They know the you know, brokerage house, basically like an omnibus account that has all these sub-accounts, right? So you know, Disney was a good example, I think, recently this past year when Disney had their um, vote, you know, they had a, a basically a proxy war, right? They were voting on their shares about a very different um, structure. You know, they were being challenged by, some, you know, board members. I happen to own some Disney shares. So I can tell you, I was getting stuff sent in the mail that wasn't coming from Disney or the challenging shareholder, they have to go hire firms, they have to go spend a lot of money tracking us down and figuring ways to do it. If on a blockchain, you know, theoretically, you would know every owner and be able to contact them. And that's one thing we think about at T0. If you have shares on a blockchain, 
you're going to know every one of your shareholders directly and can create a relationship with them, whether that is in, you know, shares of your company or fractionalization of an asset you have, you'll have ways of communicating and in some cases, even marketing to that person. Like I said, I think we're just in the first inning. There's lots of infrastructure, I think, that has to get built and people getting used to it. Um, and it'll be like that snowball I talked about. At first, it's going to seem excru excru you know, extremely slow. And then all of a sudden, the acceleration is going to happen. I mean, look at AI this year. It has been out there for a long time. And then all of a sudden, you know, chat GBT came out and it was more functional and it exploded how quick people adapted to it. So, and we're still in the very early days there, right? That's part of the reason why we're long a lot of the data centers because it's easy to get excited about AI, but you need the infrastructure to make it work. So really, uh, I won't call it a prisoner's dilemma, but the people behind, you know, really behind all the, you know, whether it be the crypto or the AI, uh, there are huge energy drains and, and, you know, it's also a lot of people who I think are sensitive and would want to be pro climate, uh, uh, you know, uh, pro climate, uh, I guess, you know, carbon emissions and, and making the world less car more carbon neutral, but at the same time, everyone wants all their goodies, right? So sure. they want their AI and their crypto and, and those are huge energy drains. So it's a bit of a dilemma and there's, Obviously, lots of people working on ways to de be carbon neutral in those data centers. But I agree with you. I think the need for energy seems to not be uh, in any way, shape, or form slowing down. If anything, it's going to grow. And I agree with you. Given your experience and how things can um, build on inertia, and, and knowing that we're still very, very early, yeah. you know, what do you think about some of these projections um, around you know, real world assets. No, nobody talks about billions. Everybody seems to talk about trillions. You know, you got to walk, you got to crawl, walk, and then run, right? Now, how quick you get to running, that's always hard to say. So it will get there, in my opinion, it will get there. But, you know, and things move logarithmically, but let me go back to my kind of CME ice days. I think I was actually on the trading floor. It was before I worked for the exchange back in the late 80s. And they kept saying that, you know, electronic trading was coming. I mean, there was a thing they, this CME launched a thing called Globex uh, at the time, which was their electronic trading one. And all the exchanges had their own electronic trading. All the guys on the floor were screaming, you know, we're all going to be out of business in a year or two. We're going to be replaced by computers. You know, it probably took 20 years before that even came close to, you know, 20 to 25 years before it really effectuated it. And everyone thought it was going to happen tomorrow. So, um, and I think you see that a little in AI, you know, I think they, oh, we're going to replace all the jobs, you know, by next year, they'll all be replaced. Now, things are moving faster, right? The adoption of Technology is quicker and quicker and quicker, as you can see, you've seen many, many charts, you know, look how, you know, from, you know, how quick people, you know, got on the internet to cell phone. I mean, a, a, the adaptation of technology is getting quicker, no question, but it's still going to take some time and you have to, um, you know, lay the groundwork, get some early pioneers with some successes and there's going to be plenty of failures. And once it gets going, once the snowball goes before you know it, it just happens. You know, it just, it, 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 it's just that, you know, that, 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 uh, you know, hockey stick happens. It's just the beginnings of the hockey stick seem, seem a lot slower. So I do think it's going to happen just because it makes sense. Like we talked about immutable yeah. records, you know, the world's going more and more digital, um, you know, the internet took, it, it took a long time. I remember early in my work days, just getting people onto email took years, but once it did, then it's like, I can't even imagine how did, pe you know, how did I work without emails, right? It just, it, and and that, that I think is what's going to happen. So um, it's, but it's fun, right? All this is fun. So David, when, 
moving, moving to current days now, right? Um, uh, you've, you've got a deal for a hotel in Aspen, and then you've got another deal um, that, that has to do with home ownership, right? right? How's the pipeline building for you? I mean, are you just randomly going to Colorado and then all of a sudden the deal <laughs> pops up? No. So look, uh, that's a, that's a great question. So you never know where it goes, right? Obviously you have connections, uh, through your life or your network, but also T zero had some background. I think in terms of blockchain and things like that, I think real estate's a natural thing. People gravitate towards. That's one thing. Um, but we're working, not just, you know, we're not working just on digital. We're doing non-digital now as well. You don't, have to do digital. So we've kind of, we're doing secondary trading and now we've pivoted to also do, not pivoted, but we've also added primary trading. So that's new. And we had to build all the systems and I know it's probably frustrating for a lot of people, but it took a long time to integrate and build those systems in the right way. Look, I think there's people who are what I'll call those we talked about earlier, pioneers, people who are really believe in uh, the digitization of assets um, on blockchain, um, fractionalization of assets. They're looking because they see the potential. So that's one group. And then we see a group of people. And if you look at it now, a lot of the uh, people, let's say under the age of 35 and under, um, if you look at how they want to invest, they want to invest um, in things they know. now. Not that we don't, but if you would have told me 25 years ago, you know, people would be investing in gym shoes. I don't know if I would have for 30 years ago. I don't think I would have believed you, but that's a thing that is very popular now. And people do sports teams too, right? And you sports teams that. and people, uh, you know, are interested in art and people, you know, want to buy and sell art, things they know and baseball cards and, you know, all types of things that, you know, are not only things they understand and know that were either, you know, collectibles, things they're very familiar with, you usually do better. I mean, Peter Lynch, you know, a very famous uh, uh, investor used to always say, invest in something you know and use and sure. understand, right? I mean, you know, in a way, Warren Buffett has a little bit of that too. <laughs> And then when I think about, in the case of collectibles, um, you know, at one point I, I knew somebody who collected stamps um, and also antiques. If you know the provenance, right. it adds credibility, right? So no that's why this could really take off in a lot of different ways because it's permanent. Right. I mean, think about the art world, right? Historically, there have been, you know, forgeries across the world and proving provenance and things are getting better in the collectible world. They, they have, you know, you know, grading systems for all these things. And really where we come in is, you know, I don't know that we're going to be trading thousands of baseball cards, but what we would be doing is there are things that you can fractionalize that you couldn't buy. Like I, can I buy a, you know, a million dollar Ferrari? Can the average person do that? No, but if they could buy a fractional thing of, you know, 30 or 40 cars and those things go up or sports teams is even a better one. Let's say sports teams or even players. I mean, they could, you know, securitize part of their income, for example, or they could securitize part of their, I mean, there, you know, David Bowie did it years ago with the Bowie bonds. If you remember part of his port, his music portfolio years ago, probably I think was the first, those types of things will become and should be securities that can be traded. And you can also, use the benefits of what we talked about blockchain and, and, you know, permanence of record and know that, you know, not have to worry about lots of things, but there are a lot of, you know, things that the average person or even an accredited investor won't have, don't, don't have access to unless you're either, you know, well connect, very well connected or very wealthy. You don't have access to deals. I think all those things, are the types of assets that people like us should be bringing to market. And those are the types of things we're looking at. How can we, you know, we say democratizing access, but actually it's no different than we were at, 
you know, ice when we were putting things electronic, putting out product that you don't have to jump through hurdles or know somebody to get somewhere to have an opportunity to look at it. When I looked at the RSRV deal, it's creative in that people can buy a piece of it or and they can convert that piece into you know a room rate that arguably might be going higher but they've locked in that price talk to us a little bit about that creativity and how that conclusion came um i i love that product just because of how creative it is so what you know uh so stefan de Betz, who owns the saint regis and aspen they had a uh the and uh had digitized their hotel a small portion actually before I even came to T0, I think uh, 2018 or 19. And it's it done very well, but people bought it and just held it. So it went up in value. I think maybe it tripled in value, but no one was buying or selling it in the secondary market. And Stefan wanted to come up with an idea to trade in the secondary market. And we were having conversations and the concept he came up with, which I thought was terrific, was, well, what if I kind of give people the floor? You can buy the asset, but in the worst case scenario, um, and there's two sides to the story here, why he would want to do it, but for the the purchaser um, of the fractional asset, you know, the downside will be is I'll lock in at a discounted rate today, that hotel room in terms of a number of shares. So just hypothetically, let's say it's, you know, it lists at a dollar, you know, the uh, initial offerings at a dollar a share. So let's just say you buy, and it's for credit investors, let's say you bought 100,000 shares, okay? So now uh, a room's 100 is $1,000. The concept was, let's say just hypothetically, and I don't think this is necessarily the right exchange rate, you could get it for 80, 800 shares. So right away, you're getting a 20% discount, but it'll always be 800 shares. So as inflation happens, and let's say the room in five years is now $2,000. So I still have only spent $800. If I haven't sold the shares, I can go redeem the shares for a room, or I can sell them on the secondary market. You know, maybe instead of, um, maybe I can sell them for, I don't want to use the room, but someone else would. I might be able to sell them for, you know, 17 or $1,800, or let's say, you know, $2 a share, that person's still getting a discount and can convert them to rooms, but then I can sell my shares or a portion of them. So I just thought that was innovative. And then he kind of combined it with another idea, which was, um, which we talked about a lot is, you know, there's a big thing now with private clubs, especially if you're in New York, anyone who goes to New York and, or London. So what if you own X number of shares, you would also get access to things like private club type uh, experiences, whether it be, you know, you know, in his case, it could be, a, you know, hella skiing or it be, you know, uh, a concert he holds at the St. Regis Aspen, or if it's a place in New York, if it was a hotel in New York, you know, they'd have a private club or a private dining, private terrace. So I thought that was just a great idea where you're combining two things, um, that you can use, which is a two-way street with both the uh, fractional or the uh, the fractionalized shareholder and the entity to have more of a relationship. That brings up a question about um, deal size in general. You know, mm -hmm. what has been the range of in the primary market of of deals? That's a good question. So. Let's say just from a few million to over a hundred million is kind of what people are looking for. That's kind of the range. I think there's a lot of people out there um, all between, you know, I would say those were the ranges. Pretty much under that is really. The secondary market developed after the primary market has been closed and completed? Yes. Yes. That, that's what happens. You close the secondary and then you you know, depending on the type of structure, whether it's Reg A, Reg D, or Reg CF, there's timing issues before you can open it up. Like a Reg D, you can open up to retail a full year after. Reg D is more the accredited investor, so accredited investors can be involved. And then after a year, 
it becomes you know seasoned and then it can open up to to the average uh, retail investor so dtcc is a huge company in the context of assets right they're basically a quasi utility it's a you know they're the depository trust clearing corporation so they clear all us equities and you know securities i think i saw uh, that they let's see in 2022 they processed some two and a half quadrillion in transactions. Oh, think about it; it's every every you know you know the treasury market. You know it's it's everything, right? It's every share of stock goes through them. Yes. So, so, I mean, they so, don't do equity options. That's the OCC, which I also was on the board on. So the options are a separate clearinghouse, but it's 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 so, all secure. It's all those securities. They don't do Things like, you know, what ICE, ICE has their own clearing in the derivatives markets, the futures markets are separate, but it's all securities. So, so w when a company like that looks at securency, right, what are they looking for? I got to be careful because I was a board member. So, look, I, I wasn't there when they bought it, but they had kind of a, um, a group, like almost a, uh, I want to call it a VC, but a group that was always looking at emerging types of businesses or technologies that could be bolt-ons or add-ons to their different types of business. So my guess is with security, they see potentially if the world starts going digital, they want to have them be a player in it. Um, that would be my, my guess as to why they uh, did things like that. They've invested in a variety, you know, some to some sex, some to some failure of you know, lack of a bird, uh, lack of a better word, startup type VC investing, and you know, which is a little odd for a utility, but I think they were doing it. They're they're putting their feet in the ground, right? In anticipation of the TAM really exploding in real world assets. I can't speak to them, but if it were, you know, my guess is this is just a guess that they. It, if the world starts doing more digital assets, they don't want to be put out of business. I mean, let, let right? I mean, they want to be involved. So here, let's take T0. And I'm not saying, you know, let's say every stock in the world started to trade on the blockchain and there's like technology reasons. You don't really need the, a DTCC, right? I mean, what's yeah. the point, right? They're processing and, you know, if you and I do a trade and it's a mutable record, there's no reason for a DTC to be involved. So my guess is how do I put myself in the food chain so I don't potentially become irrelevant? And so that would be my yeah. observation. Along those same lines, you've got Franklin Templeton, you've got BlackRock, um, you've got Fidelity hitting headlines all about Bitcoin and Ethereum spot. But to me, really, their focus is going to be on blockchain and tokenization and how that evolves. And that's probably where they're going to make, frankly, more money. Yeah, look, I once again can't speak for them. My gut would be they're probably looking at both. I mean, there's lots of regular and have been, as you know, regulatory uncertainties in around whether a lot of crypto assets are in fact securities or not, right? My view is that if you're buying something for the purpose of sole purpose of buying it at X and selling it at, you know, at X plus or X two X, you know, more than you bought it for If That's your intent. And it's not your intent to just, you know, use it. And then just by luck, it's worth more later on, you know, in the case of the former, I think that's usually a security in most, most tests, right. You know, if I'm buying a car and I'm driving it and it happens at the end of five years to be worth more, I don't know if that's a security. But if I'm buying something in my anticipation, the only reason I'm buying it is not to use it, but I think I'm going to sell it for more than I purchased for it. That's my, that's the reason I'm purchasing it. That's usually a security. I Back to them, I don't know, you know, the crypto world, the ETFs, the Ethereums, all those you know, Bitcoins, you know, the cat's out of the bag. You know, one could argue those are securities, but how now you can't put, 
the genie back in the bottle. I don't know how they could do that because it's trading all over the world. Um, if they could, I think people would personally, but I don't know that the genie's out of the bottle. So uh, I don't know that uh, they figured that out. So with that in mind, I think some of these people are saying if the, and I don't know, I can't speak for them, but if the genie's out of the bottle, maybe I should be, you know, in that world. And then separately to the real world tokenization, di digitalization, I think, sure. Um, I think they want to be there if it, if, 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 and when it goes. And like I said, they probably, these are companies that you all mentioned that are in it for the long haul. And we, as we talked about much earlier in our discussion, I think that um, these are things that are going to, uh, over time, uh, happen. You know, like we said, it's you know, maybe it'll be millions, billions, trillions, but, you know, they, they probably have the long view as well, that it'll get there. And, you know, we should be in uh, on the ground floor with probably not a lot of investment. So generally speaking, I think P0 is in good shape from the standpoint of positioning as a platform. Can you speak to whether you need capital immediately when what the outlook is for that? So um, look, we're fine on capital. I'm not looking to do you know a capital raise. We're not running out of money. Um, I think we're trying to be as prudent as we can with capital. And we're, we feel, you know, I, I feel good where we're at. So you know, I don't need to put a stamp on what valuation is. That's just not. You know, I don't need to raise capital just to raise capital. That doesn't seem to make sense. So um, why would you dilute existing shareholders if you don't have to, right? So you, you raise capital when you think you can, you know, the raise is much more offset by the growth or the opportunity, actually, that that capital provides. Um, or if you're desperate for cash and, you know, it's, 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 uh, necessary for you to actually survive. Um, so I'm in neither of those camps right now. If an opportunity came where I felt that a raise of capital would, you know, make us grow 10x and the capital was, you know, uh, even though there was some dilution, it would more than be offset by the, the uh, exponential growth. That would be a reason. Um, and or if there was a reason that I needed it to survive, and I'm not in that camp either. So, uh, you know, that that's kind of where we're at. So right now we're kind of in an organic growth, trying to develop some partnerships, get some equity in some of the deals we do, um, and, and grow our business that way. David, thanks very much. Um, next time I have you back, I'm going to ask you questions about other industries that are gonna be transformed by tokenization and blockchain. Appreciate the time. Yeah. It was great, Dan, um, chatting with you as always. Yeah. Be well.